there's a lot of hype about cryptocurrencies as a financing venue for terrorism. It's hype and it's not true. Only a tiny proportion of terrorism finance goes, is channeled through cryptocurrencies and other crypto assets. There is a network of payments which serves as the private banking of terrorists the world over. It's known as Hawala. And this is the topic of today's video. My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. As the New York Times have recently exposed, Hamas own dozens of small businesses, mining, chicken farming, believe it or not, road construction, small businesses in Pakistan, Algeria, Turkey and Sudan. Hamas possess prime real estate in all these countries, as well as skyscrapers in the United Arab Emirates. All in all, Hamas's portfolio amounts to about $500 million in investments. Hamas also control, not to say appropriate, the $1.1 billion in annual transfers from the Palestinian Authority, and they collaborate with UNRWA under the radar. Another 60 to $360 million in Qatari funds are funneled every year to defray the costs of supporting 100,000 indigent families and pay the salaries of civil servants such as teachers, doctors, and an assortment of bureaucrats. A total of 1.49 billion USD has been transferred from Qatar to the Hamas between 2012 and 2021, a lot of it with Israel's blessing. But Hamas's bloodline is the informal money transfer network known as Hawala, through which they receive about $100 million annually in donations in Iranian aid. The money is routed through banks in the USA, Europe, Turkey, Qatar, Iran, and the, UA, the United Arab Emirates before it makes its way into the penumbral spider web of Hawala. In the wake of the September 11 terrorist attacks on the United States, attention was drawn to the age-old secretive and globe-spanning banking system developed in Asia and known as Hawala, to change in Arabic. Hawala means to change. The Hawala is based on a short-term this on short-term discountable negotiable promissory notes or bills of exchange called hundi while not limited to muslims it has come to be identified with islamic banking islamic law the sharia regulates commerce and finance in the fiqh al muamalat transactions among people modern muslim banks are overseen by the Sharia Supervisory Board of Islamic Banks and Institutions, the Sharia, Sharia Committee. The Shia's Islamic laws, according to the fatwa of Ayatollah al uzzama Sayyid Ali al husseini Sistani, has this to say about Hawala banking. Point 2298, or Article 2298. If a debtor directs his creditor to collect his debt from a third person, and the creditor accepts the arrangement, the third person will, on completion of all the conditions to be explained later, become the debtor. Thereafter, the creditor cannot demand his debt from the first debtor. The Prophet Muhammad, a cross-border trader of goods and commodities by profession, encouraged the free movement of goods and the development of markets. Numerous Muslim scholars railed against hoarding and harmful speculation, market cornering and manipulation known as gharar. Muslims were the first to use promissory notes and assignment or transfer of debts via bills of exchange, hawala. Among modern banking instruments, only floating and therefore uncertain interest payments, riba and jahala, futures contracts and forfeiting are frowned upon. But agile Muslim traders easily and often easily and often circumvent these religious restrictions by creating synthetic mu'abaha, 
synthetic contracts, identical to Western forwards and futures contracts. Actually, the only allowed transfer or trading of debts, as distinct from the underlying commodities or the underlying goods, is under the Hawala. So what is the Hawala? Hawala consists of transferring money, usually across borders and in order to avoid taxes or the need to bribe officials, without physical or electronic transfer of funds. Money changers, known as Hawala Dags, re receive cash in one country, no questions asked. Correspondent Hawala Dags in another country dispense an identical amount, minus minimal fees and commissions, to a recipient, or less often, to a bank account. Email or letter, hundi, carrying couriers are used to convey the necessary information, the amount of money, the date, the date it has to be paid on, and so on, between Hawala Dags. The sender provides a recipient with code words or numbers, for instance, the serial numbers of currency notes, a digital encrypted message or a grid signal like handshake to be used to retrieve the money. Big Hawala Dows use a chain of middlemen in cities around the globe. But most Hawala Dows are actually small businesses. Their Hawala activity is a sideline or moonlighting operation. Cheats, verbal agreements, substitute for certain written records. In bigger operations, there are human memorizers who serve as arbiters in case of dispute. The Hawala system requires unbounded trust. Hawala Dars are often members of the same family, same village or clan or ethnic group. It is a system older than the West itself. The ancient Chinese had their own Hawala, uh, the Fei Qian, or flying money. Arab traders used to avoid being robbed on the Silk Road by using Hawala equivalent services. Cheating is punished by effective excommunication and loss of honor, the equivalent of an economic death sentence. Physical violence is very rare, but not unheard of. Violence sometimes also erupts between money recipients and robbers who are, after the huge quantities of physical cash, sloshing about the system. But these two are rare events, as rare as bank robberies, for example. One result of this effective social regulation is that commodity traders in Asia shift hundreds of millions of US dollars per trade based solely on trust and the verbal commitment of their counterparts. Hawala arrangements are used to avoid customs duties, consumption taxes, and other trade-related levies. Suppliers provide importers with lower prices on their invoices, and they get paid the difference via Hawala. Legitimate transactions and tax evasion constitute the bulk of Hawala operations. Modern Hawala networks emerged in the 1960s and 1970s to circumvent official bans on gold imports in Southeast Asia and to facilitate the transfer of hard-earned wages of expatriates to their families, home remittances, and their conversion at rates more favorable, often double, the, than the government's rates. Hawala provides a cheap, it costs about, it costs about one amount, 1% uh, of the amount transferred, so it's cheap, it's efficient, and it's a fric frictionless alternative to morbid and corrupt domestic financial institutions. It is Western Union without the high-tech gear and the exorbitant transfer fees. Unfortunately, these age-old networks have been hijacked and compromised by drug traffickers, mainly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, corrupt officials, secret services, money launderers, uh, organized crime, and terrorists. Pakistani Hawala networks alone move up to $5 billion annually, according to estimates by Pakistan's Minister of Finance, Shaukut Aziz, at the time. In 1999, Institutional Investor Magazine identified 1,100 1, money brokers in Pakistan and transactions that ran as high as $10 million apiece. As opposed to stereotypes, most Hawala networks are not controlled by Arabs, but by Indian and Pakistani expatriates and immigrants in the Gulf. 
The Hawala network in India has been brutally and ruthlessly demolished by Indira Gandhi during the emergency regime imposed in 1975. But Indian nationals still play a big part in international Hawala networks. Similar networks in Sri Lanka, Philippines and Bangladesh have also been eradicated. The OECD's Financial Action Task Force, FATF, has this to say. Hawala remains a significant method for large numbers of businesses of all sizes and individuals to repatriate funds and purchase gold. It is favored because it usually costs less than moving funds through the banking system. It operates 24 hours per day and every day of the year. It is virtually completely reliable and there is minimal paperwork required. That's a report on money laundering typologies, 1999-2000, but issued by the Financial Action Task Force on February 3rd, 2000. Hawala networks closely feed into Islamic banks throughout the world and to commodity trading in South, South Asia. There are more than 200 Islamic banks in the USA alone and many thousands in Europe, North and South Africa, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, especially the Free Zone in Dubai, the Free Zone in Bahrain, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries. By the end of 1998, the overt, the tip of the iceberg liabilities of these financial institutions amounted to 148 billion US dollars. They dabbled in equipment leasing, real estate leasing and development, corporate equity and trade, structured trade and commodities financing, usually in consortia called Mudaraba. While previously confined to the Arab Peninsula and to South and East Asia, this mode of traditional banking became truly international in the 1970s, following the unprecedented flow of wealth to many Muslim nations due to the oil shocks and the emergence of the Asian tigers. Islamic banks joined forces with corporations, multinationals and banks in the West to finance oil exploration and drilling, mining and agribusiness. Many leading law firms in the West, such as Norton Rose, Freshfields, Clyde & Co and Clifford Chance have Islamic finance teams which are familiar with Islam compatible commercial contracts. But what about Hawala and terrorism? Anti-terrorist legislation in the United States and in the United Kingdom allows government agencies to regularly supervise and inspect businesses that are suspected of being a front for the Hawala banking system. It makes it a crime to smuggle more than $10,000 in cash across USA borders and empowers the Treasury Secretary and its Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, to tighten record keeping and reporting rules for banks and financial institutions based in the USA. A new interagency foreign terrorist asset tracking center, FTAT, was set up at the time. A 1993 moribund proposed law requiring US-based Hawaladar to register and to report suspicious transactions was revived. These relatively radical measures reflect the belief that the Al-Qaeda network of Osama bin Laden used or uses the Hawala system to raise and move funds across national borders. A Hawaladar in Pakistan, uh, Dihab Shil, was identified as a financier in the attacks on the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. But the USA is not the only country to face terrorism finance by Hawala networks. In mid-2001, the Delhi Police, the Indian Government's Enforcement Directorate, ED, and the Military Intelligence, MI, arrested six Jammu Kashmir Islamic Front, JKIF, terrorists. The arrests led to the exposure of an enormous web of Hawala institutions in Delhi, aided and abetted, some say, by the ISI, Inter-Services Intelligence, Pakistan's security services. The Hawala network was used to funnel money to terrorist groups in the disputed Kashmir Valley. Luckily, the, fo the common perception that Hawala fi financing is paperless is wrong, of course. The transfer of information regarding the funds often leaves digital, though heavily encrypted, trails. 
couriers and contract memorizers. Gold dealers, commodity merchants, transporters and moneylenders can be apprehended and interrogated. Written physical letters are still the favorite mode of communication among small and medium Howell adults, who also invariably resort to extremely detailed single entry bookkeeping. And the sudden appearance and disappearance of funds in bank accounts still have to be explained. Moreover, the sheer scale of the amounts involved entails the collaboration of offshore banks and more established financial institutions in the West. Such flows of funds affect the local money markets in Asia and are instantaneously reflected in interest rates charged to frequent borrowers such as wholesalers. Spending and consumption patterns change discernibly after such influxes. Most of the money ends up in prime world banks behind flimsy business facades. Hackers in Germany claimed, without providing proof, to have infiltrated Hawala-related bank accounts. The problem is that banks and financial institutions, and not only in dodgy offshore havens, black holes in the lingo, these banks clam up they refuse to divulge information about their clients. Banking is largely a matter of fragile trust between bank and customer and tight secrecy. Bankers are reluctant to undermine either. Banks use mainframe computers which can rarely be hacked through cyberspace and can be compromised only physically in close cooperation with insiders. The shadier the bank, the more formidable its digital defenses. The use of numbered accounts, outlawed in Austria, for instance, only recently, the use of pseudonyms, still possible in Liechtenstein, uh, complicates matters. Bin Laden's accounts are unlikely to bear his name. He has collaborators, and so does Putin. Hawala networks are often used to launder money or to evade taxes. Even when employed for legitimate purposes to diversify the risk involved in the transfer of large sums, Hawala does apply techniques borrowed from money laundering. Deposits are fragmented and wired to hundreds of banks the world over. This is known as starburst. Sometimes the money ends up in the account of origin, and this is known as boomerang. Hence the focus on payment clearing and settlement systems. Most countries have only one such system, the repository of data regarding all banking and most non-banking transactions in the country. Yet even this is a partial solution. Most national systems maintain records for only six to 12 months, private settlement and clearing systems for even less. Yet the crux of the problem is not the Hawala or the Hawala does. The corrupt and inept, gov inept, corrupt and inept, inept governments everywhere, not only in Asia, are to blame for not regulating the banking systems for over-regulating everything else, for not fostering competition, for throwing public money at bad debts and at worse borrowers, for overtaxing, for robbing the people of their life savings through capital controls, for tearing the delicate fabric of trust between customer and bank. Pakistan, for instance, froze all foreign exchange accounts a few years, uh, 20 years ago. Perhaps if Asia had reasonably expedient, reasonably priced, reasonably regulated, user-friendly banks, Osama bin Laden and the Hamas would have found it impossible to finance their mischiefs so invisibly.